I've been looking forward to having a proper chat with you for a long time. Uh, I remember in, uh, when I started my PhD, I, one of the first ever books I read for my literature review was your book on Gramsci and Ferrer. I'm really intrigued to know why was Gramsci influential for you and particularly his ideas in education? I heard a lot of Gramsci in the 70s here in Malta because mm -hmm. of our close, close association culturally with Italy. Well, Gramsci was always there, you know, always mentioned. Mm. I was not a, a member of the Communist Party, but I was invited to the general conference and somebody opened the statement by saying, truth is revolutionary, Antonio Gramsci once said. Now I had to be hearing, you know, these kind of buzzwords from Gramsci, etc. First of all, what he said is, dire la verità e rivoluzione, I found out afterwards. To say the truth mm -hmm. is revolutionary, which is not the same as saying truth is revolutionary. You know, there was something in particular about Gramsci, and it's not your signature concepts. You know, hegemony, organic intellectual, they percolate, yeah. you know, this kind of stuff. No, no, uh, in this case, it was something in particular which attracted me. And I found myself in this because I found Malta in this. And that was the famous um, interrupted document which he was writing at the time that when he was arrested, 1926, which is the um, some themes from the Southern Question. It's in English referred to as the Southern Question, La Questione Meridionale. And coupled with that, with some of his notes on, the, on, on, on Italian history, um, made me understand the situation which my own country, which is an island as well, is in. And then the Mist Revolution, which was the Neapolitan French Revolution, which was uh, considered to be a passive revolution by Gramsci, because it was not steeped in popular consciousness, but it was a bunch of intellectuals who supported the French, etc. Uh, and from where he got the name, the term, passive revolution. Because he got it from Vincenzo Cuoco, uh, 19th century um, Neapolitan philosopher who was referring to the Neapolitan revolution. So the, highlight, the whole idea of coming from a southern island, what I found was an affinity with the Mediterranean, I would say. I'm sure that you coming from Egypt will find this kind of affinity. What I find interesting is his writing on the Arab world, where he tends to confuse Muslim and Arab. Amazing for a man of his intellect. Yeah, um, having said that, um, no, it was the island factor and the fact of being the Mediterranean. So I always had it in me that when we write about education, mm. do something on the southern question. Everybody writes about the school and education, the Unitarian school. Yeah. Everybody writes yes. about the organic intellectual. But very few people write about the southern question and education. As, as an Egyptian, I, I thought Gramsci can help make lots of sense of what's happening in Egypt. It's There's been lots of things yeah, written on, on, on Gramsci uh, in Egypt. There's a gentleman called Roberto uh, Rocco. He's written on uh, the political economy of the revolution. He used the Gramscian framework. It was called Gramsci in Cairo. Wow. And it was, it was the political economy of uh, Mubarak's uh, regime and how it failed to be hegemonic. And his argument is saying that this is why, one of the reasons why the Mubarak regime failed, because the yeah. neoliberal business cronies of Mubarak failed to gather enough consent for the um, for the project. There's a spontaneous uprising, etc., and then the Gramscian question: Is there conscious direction? Direzione consapevole. And then the big question is: If there is, where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it always goes back to the historical. Um, situation which repeats itself and always ends in tragedy, never in farce, actually, is that you can have all the goodwill in the world and you go out on a spontaneous uh, pouring of outrage against lack of jobs, yes. lack of dignity, you know, corruption, mm. etc. At the same time, if you don't have a revolutionary theory behind it or a revolutionary strategy behind it, somebody else will. And that somebody else is organizing without probably making um, 
you know, like making it very ov o o obvious. And therefore, yes. they, tr they could take a different a tra a trajectory at the furthest remove from what you had in mind, from what mm. the people out on the streets had in mind, uh, or many people out on the streets, because I'm sure there are going to be people who are going to subscribe to the Brotherhood, for example. So basically, um, it was a question of direction. Where is the direction coming from? You know, when you have a crisis of legitimation, which is what you had, then there mm. could be a recurse to re the repressive forces of the state. We've had false, that's an expression we use, false dawns, you know, before. We've had so much yes. of the whole history of, of, the whole history of the world has been, you know, full of these false dawns. I mean, if you look at what Marx wrote, I mean, he was looking mm. at the situations which really gave him hope. I mean, I cannot think of anything better than the commune. He built his, he modeled his own idea of a society from the commune. But that only lasts yes. for how much, 40 days or something? Yes, Egypt at the moment is very repressive. And the window of opportunity we had after 2011 till 2013, yeah. it's not going to happen again yeah. some time. Yet, hegemony is never complete. It's never all-encompassing all the time. It's always contested. It's always challenged. Wow. And I wanted to explore how it's challenged in means that are different from protests or sit-ins or, or violent demonstrations or... Because there is hope. Uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, uh, which I know wasn't Gramsci's uh, word. He took it from... Romain Roland. I, I mean, ho hope springs eternal, I know.